We're going to wrap up kind of what we talked about. We talked about the miracle of America, where Thomas Jefferson is the one, the man, the man who came up with the idea from the Anglo-Saxons and the first five books of the Bible, which is would, would be called the Pentateuch or the Torah, uh, he put that together and said, this is the society we want. This is what we want. And later on, when he was in France, he sent 200 books uh, to James Madison in 1784. And Madison read every one of those books. It took him two years to do it, and he almost killed himself doing it. And then he was prepared for the Constitutional Convention in 1787. That was our first lesson. Second lesson was capitalism versus socialism. We had a film and we, we talked about the differences between the two. The third lesson was how the uh, founding fathers were influenced by great philosophers like Locke and Montesquieu and Cicero and Polybius and Adam Smith. And we tried to tie all that together because they got these ideas from others and they incorporated the ideas. And, uh, of course, The Wealth of Nations was written what year? 1776. Just in time. So uh, this, this is a great story that has been missed now in our gen We're living in 2015 now. And the story is not being told anymore. And one of the reasons it's not being told is because some people don't realize what the story was. Now, then we had a fourth lesson which was a tearjerker for me, um, Washington creates America. And we found out in that lesson, and by the way, thank you for coming. A lot of you have been here uh, at great expense to your own self uh, to, to hear someone that um, takes a haircut now and finds he doesn't have much hair left. Uh, I really appreciate it. and. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing that you're doing. Uh, but in the fourth lesson, we had Washington Creates America. And we found out that Washington was a one in a, in a quadrillion. We found out there was nobody like him. We found out that, that there was a prophecy about him in 1770. That's never taught in the schools because it's in Dr. Craig's diary. So they just kind of discounted it. Dr. Craig, of course, was the physician for Washington. And the prophecy says it's by an Indian chief who almost killed Washington, but he couldn't kill him at the Battle of Monongahela in 1755. The prophecy is that he would be a great spirit that would lead a great country and a great nation. Uh, that needs to be told to the young people. Then we had... Um, the fifth lesson was um, the father of the Constitution. And we have found now, in the year 2015, that James Madison has been not only thrown under the bus, but we, we're, we distastefully don't want to read what Madison had to say. We need to read it. And you young people that are here tonight need to read the Federalist Papers. Very important that you read that. And uh, I would suggest that you read it out loud. Take the Federalist Papers and read it out loud. You'll you read it slowly. And it's, it's, it's not an easy read, but you can, you can understand it. We have faith in you. Then last week, um, uh, we had a sixth lesson on the first seven presidents of the United States and really what they thought of the Constitution and how they interpreted it. We're not interpreting it that way anymore. As a matter of fact, we stopped interpreting it the way the first seven presidents interpreted when? when who was really the first president who said, you know what, I don't, I don't really think we should interpret it this way? It was, it was Roosevelt, it was Teddy Roosevelt. Now, Teddy Roosevelt did some very good things, but he did not, I have some angst against him on the interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, because uh, he said that um, if the Constitution does not prohibit it, we can do it. That's turning it upside down. That's not 
the meaning of it. Well, tonight, we have a lesson that's called Restoring America. We have 11 pages. Uh, Robin was telling you of the sites uh, you can look on. If you've missed some of the uh, seminars here, you can go on this site. And Kevin, who's sitting in the front, has done great work in, in, uh, in video, videoing all of these. You can go here. Uh, you can go to that site and see it. I think it's going to be on the RVTV on Fridays and Wednesdays uh, also. And there's a few other sites. We have, I think it's 24 uh, copies back there. We have 24 copies of my notes. We're sharing all the notes. You want to read these notes? Um, it's good to read them at night because you'll fall asleep really easy. <laughs> and you'll, you'll just be out cold, really, <laughs> if you read these notes. And um, you can get these notes, by the way, on this website, too. We have 24 copies back there, and they'll take your uh, email address if you want the notes. We'll send you copies of the notes. Joel, it'll be the third one, not the first one. Okay, the third one. Yes, this, this is the site where you'll get the notes. What would Jefferson do .net. That's where you get the notes there. Um, these are notes, uh, I've worked a long time on these notes. I want people to have them and see what solutions you might take. Now, you may not agree with all the solutions. That's okay. Uh, you can be wrong sometimes. <laughs> but um, I think that um, it's important to know. Now, I want to read you first from uh, Congressman Paul Ryan in a book that he wrote called The Way Forward. Renewing the American Idea, and this is on page 143 to 144. The American Idea is a way of life, one that enables each person to chart their own course, pursue their own happiness, and govern their own lives. Why is this so special? For most of human history, a very different idea reigned supreme. The idea that a few were born to rule, and everyone else was destined to obey. The common man lives to serve the king, the despot, or the state. They were subjects, serfs, or slaves. Our forefathers rebelled <clears throat> against this long-held belief. To this day, America is exceptional in part because it was the first country explicitly founded on the ideas of natural rights, human equality, and self-governance. It was the first to take these articles of faith and write them into law. It was the first to tell the world that nothing else has happened like this. It's the only place this has happened. We shouldn't throw this away so cavalierly. It took a lot of blood and treasure to get to where we are today. Um, we have people that don't like the Constitution. They want to get, they really want to uh, do something else. We can't do that because then uh, we've thrown away what really has worked over a course and a long period of time. Well, Paul Ryan goes on. To prove by its example, we don't want to force anybody. We don't want to go in other countries and start nation states. We want to prove by our example. The great moral example that America has. We've, we've now in the past years, we're, we're not the moral example that we should be. We need to change that. But that's how, you, how other countries can see us. And they can say, well, we want to be like that. That the best government rests on the consent of the governed. Now, of course, uh, Paul Ryan is quoting Jefferson. Everybody's quoted Jefferson. Uh, he's the one who had the words, and he put them on paper. He's the one who set the policy and the articles of faith <laughs> for what we are and why we are that. And uh, he did it in 17 days, a little brick building in Second Market. And uh, in the first day, he had most of it written, but he took 16 other days to get it just right, get the first part just right. Well. It was the first country 
to proclaim that our rights come not from rulers, but from God Almighty. The American idea is a vision of human equality in a just and free society, and the founders created the best political system for advancing that idea. That's the way forward by Paul Ryan. Now, let's talk a little bit about the culture first, because I have to tell you my belief is this. Uh, it's not balancing budgets. It's not overseas foreign, foreign affairs or foreign entanglements. It's our culture. You want to you change things? Change the culture. If you very carefully read the Bible and uh, look at what happened uh, early on, when Israel was not listening to God, things happened very, very bad. Very bad things happened. It's in the area of when you listen and you think and you ponder on the, the great truths of an almighty God, then things can start to work. Things will work. Right now our culture is not good. We, um, Adam Smith, the great um, economic philosopher, wrote this great book. <clears throat> By the way, this is The Wealth of Nations. This book should be required in the high schools. In, 19, in the 1920s they kicked it out of the colleges, and they put in Das Kapital and the Communist Manifesto. They didn't think the wealth. They didn't think Adam Smith's ideas were good anymore. We need to read this. This is a very difficult read, but we need to at least in high school read parts of this and be required to know what this is. This is a very important book, and in the book, Adam Smith, who was a Scotsman, never did get married, but he. He, um, I think he's speaking to us from the dead. He didn't like what I said. Uh, he, um, he was a genius. He wrote a book called the, um, um, yeah, maybe you can fix that. Uh, remember, we're in a library here, and sometimes the library doesn't have the best audio and visual. Um, he, um, wrote a book called the, the Theory of Moral Sentiments. I brought that in one time. And he, he felt that economics had a moral component to it. And you needed to get within that moral component to get the right thing. And what kind of economics was going on at the time of Adam Smith? What was, what was the world, uh, what were they going to? Mercantilism. 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 And that's where you protect your country, you have very high um, tariffs. You want, to, you want to get as many goods as you can, but you have high tariffs to protect your own goods. And Smith took a look at that and he said, this isn't, this isn't the right way to go. Um, you want to turn that on? I'm off now. I know some people would probably like me off, but why don't you turn that on? There, there it's on now. Okay. Um, so, uh, Smith felt that there was a moral component to the science of economics. How do you like that? Blackstone felt the same thing in law. And they, they kind of put these ideas together, they put them on paper, and Adam Smith came up with an idea that you have very little government intervention, and you have the freedom to buy and sell and try and you have the freedom to fail. You have to have the freedom to fail. That has to be in there. You have a profit and loss statement. The loss part is just as important as the profit part. You gotta be able to fail. We don't need to bail out Chrysler. We did, we shouldn't have because when they fail, something comes up, something better will approach. I gave the story of the, the lemonade stand and and a, a little boy named Johnny was, had a, well, let's see. I'm going to lift this. Is that all right if I lift this? Here. Sure. Because you'll need to see this, but. Uh, you can come back after. Uh, back you can, you can do it afterwards, I guess. You got a lemonade stand here. I've, to I've talked to you about this before. But here's um, Johnny. Johnny's over here. That's Johnny the entrepreneur. 
He has eyes, by the way. He's really happy because he's selling this lemonade over here. And he's selling it for 25 cents a glass. Oh boy, and I'll tell you, that lemonade's good because on a hot day, it gets real humid like it is today. You know, you go out there and get that lemonade. Oh, it's so good. 25 cents a glass. He's doing a great business. Tremendous business. He happens to be outside of IBM over here. And the, uh, the administration people see that this guy's selling this little John. He's, he's only 10 years old, you know. And he's, um, he's selling this for 25 cents a glass, and he's making really great money. And so this big corporation, IBM, you know, these corporations are terrible. They're so mean. They, he, they come along. They come along, and they, they say, um, look, um, we're going to get a kachu machine. We're going to have all these flavors of lemonade. Okay? We're going to have strawberry in here. We're going to have peach lemonade. We're going to have a mixture of lemonades. Oh, it's going to be really good. And all you have to do is put 10 cents in here. And you get one of these. What happens to Johnny? He's out of business. He's out of business unless he gets another machine. He gets a loan. He does something and gets a better machine or more flavors, something like that. And that's it. Nobody came in between that. There was competition and you benefited from it. And so Adam Smith had this theory and he explained it. And it just so happens that he came up with the theory in 1776, just in the nick of time. Because the founding fathers had read, they, they decided to read Adam Smith and Thomas Jefferson again said that this is the best book on economics extant. Now I went to a history, I go to a lot of different history seminars and teachers and everything, and one teacher who's a, a real brain child uh, said that um, Jefferson did not know economics. And she was teaching all these people, and I was in the class and I thought I was going to commit suicide, I decided not to. Um, Jefferson knew economics. Uh, as a matter of fact, he made one of the greatest real estate deals in the history of man. Louisiana Purchase. Doubled the size of the country. Yeah, he knew economics. He knew a lot of other things too. But now we're so smart that we can just look at Thomas Jefferson and say, well, he didn't know that. So uh, He thought that uh, The Wealth of Nations was the best economics book that was available. And, and we're going to try this new theory. Well, they put it in place and by the time the Civil War had ended, and we got about to the 1890s and the beginning of the 1900s, America was producing half the world's goods. They were producing all of these goods and all these people. We didn't have enough jobs. We had so many jobs, we couldn't fill them all. We were advertising overseas, please come to America and so you can get a job. There's four things a national government must do. We don't want them to intervene in economic activity. We want them to stay out of that. Because they, they have a tendency to come into it and they specialize, they help producers too much. We want consumers to benefit. And we don't want government tying in with economic activity because they make it unjust. They, 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 they make it abnormal, so to speak. They give special privileges to others. We don't want that. So, what, we, um, what he said was there's four things, though, that the national government should do. What are they? Defense. Well, you should do defense, but he was, he was talking about an economic protect engine. Protect property. To, well, you have to protect your property. Let me tell you what, what things they should guard against. They should guard against four things. One of them is debauchery. I should spell instead of write. Yeah. Uh, it's, in, it's in your if notes. If you print it, that's how you spell it. It's in the notes. <laughs> it's in the notes, but the, you don't have the notes <laughs> yet. Uh, what is debauchery? We're probably not going to get through this, but I'm going to do the best I can. Sins of the what flesh. is debauchery? Sins of the flesh. <laughs> well, it's it's yeah, that's right. It's yes. It's self-indulgence, it's the vices. You're getting involved with the vices, you're getting involved with the tremendous gambling that's going on, the drug trade, alcoholism, uh, prostitution. Uh, uh, strip joints are controlled, I, I remember when I was on city council, 
And I, I remember we, well, he had just started the city, it was Federal Way, Federal Way, Washington, 1989. I was on that first city council and we had started the city. And I remember saying, we need to close down Deja Vu. <laughs> and uh, the attorney who we were contracting him out at the time came to me and said, if you, if you say another word, we're going to be sued. Well, who are we going to be sued by? Well, you're going to be sued by the owners of Deja Vu. Well, we later found out that the owners of Deja Vu were organized crime. Now, the Supreme Court has determined that they understand what pornography is because Justice Stewart said, I know it when I see it, but it's none of his business. The, the pornography and all of these illicit things are the community. Community decides it. They make the decisions. You know what you want in your community. You decide for your own community. We don't need nine people uh, in uh, robes who have no business in issues like that giving a whole edict for an entire country. That's wrong. And I told you last week, I gave you a homework assignment. If you didn't do it, I have a, a whip over here, and, and I'm, I'm ready for you. But you need to read Federalist 78. That's right. Federalist 78. Yes. Have you read it? Yes. Did you like it? Yes. <laughs> Hamilton writes as tough as Madison, I'll tell you. Uh, but that'll tell you what the judiciary should do. And by the way, you learned in school, every single one of you learned, because I did too. The three branches are co-equal, right? You didn't learn that? Oh, yeah. Did you learn that? Yeah, well, that's what, you, that's what most people that I've met have learned that. That's not what it is. Co-equal. They're not co-equal. They're not. Read the Federalist Papers. The judiciary is not anywhere near what the legislature is. And the, exec the executive has very little power. How do you like that? Have you read the second article in the Constitution? Very little power in there. It's uh, become... We started out with um, limited government. Then we had something called gradualism. And then we had big government. And now we have Frankenstein. You need to read, read the Federalist Papers and uh, you'll see that the branches are not co-equal. They never were intended to be co-equal. All right. Well, we need to, um, the vices have got to go. You've got to get rid of them. And the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, can enforce things like, if they think it's obscenity or things like that, they can enforce. We're not doing a very good job of that. We're not doing, it's kind of a society. Now, you can't have Adam Smith's philosophy tied to the vices. Vices generally do pretty well. But if you debauch the society, the Constitution doesn't mean anything. Declaration of Independence, none of that means anything. Because you've debauched your society, so the honesty, everything, all the, old, all the good virtues. By the way, uh, I want, um, we'll get to it sometime, but I want um, the Book of Virtues. That needs to be in the schools. That needs to be in the schools. We need to read that and decide what's in there. Just the virtues of, you know, the virtues like character and responsibility and uh, patience, things like that. We need to be teaching that. All right, there's uh, some other things. You don't want to have monopolies. Once you start to get monopolies, uh, you have, uh, that becomes an abnormality in your economic system because you've got to have a free system. If you have a monopoly, someone has an advantage. They've got the entire market and they can do a lot of things. We don't want monopolies. Very rarely do we get them. Today we're getting them through what? Yeah, mergers. Well, but uh, not all mergers are monopolies. You're getting mergers, but a monopoly is where you control 100% of the market. You can, you can have a merger, but you, you may not control 100% of the market. Where do, you, where do you get to, in gas? Well, you have different competitors in gas. You have, uh, depends who's producing it, but you've got competition in that. 
Uh, you can you can decide if you want to pay a little more or a little less somewhere. Uh, utilities. Well, utilities, but you also have them when government comes in and gives somebody a special advantage. They may have a steel tariff. They may have uh, an ethanol subsidy. Uh, things like that. When government comes in and melts, now I agree with some of my friends uh, that generally I don't agree with, and they don't agree with me, uh, that big business can be a disaster if they're tied in with government largesse. That's when it becomes bad. That's when it becomes really bad. So we gotta, we gotta head off monopolies. Fraud must be headed off uh, wrongful or criminal deception intended to result in financial or personal gain, such as counterfeiting. Now, let me mention something about that. Economically, our national currency must be restored. Amen. That's it. We've got to restore the currency. Now, economics is a very tough science. I, I teach this in this OLLI program for SOU and RCC, and we've... Um, been going through the economic history of the United States, and we're on part nine, but I, I won't be able to finish it because I won't be around to finish it. It'd probably go to part 30. But um, we have abandoned. Now people say, well, we're still doing the Constitution. We're still following it. Well, are we following Article 1, Section 10? What's Article 1, Section 10 say? Who's got their Constitution? Oh, I have mine. I have mine right here. Pat's got it, don't you, Pat? Article 1, Section 10. Okay. No state shall enter into any treaty, allowance, in confederation, grant letters of... Market reprisal, that's overseas. Coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver. Coin. A tender, a tender and payment, and payment of, of uh, that's it, stop right there, in payment of debts. We're not doing that. That's in the document, we don't do that anymore. That's been thrown out. When did it get thrown out? 1933. Well, uh, 1933 is right, we went off the domestic gold standard. We closed the gold window and, and um, the greatest ardor that the country has ever had as a president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, confiscated the gold. So if you had gold, you had to return it to the Federal Reserve Bank, closest to you, or the one of the member banks. And some people were hiding their gold because they didn't want to. They didn't think that was right. Uh, when did we close the silver window? Isn't that just about the first thing that President Johnson signed before uh, Kennedy was even buried? No, it was a little later than it was 1968. Okay. It was Johnson though. Never go up. He said, "That's it. We're never going back on the silver." Yeah, we broke the link to silver, and we were a bimetal country. We, we had bimetallism. And when did we go off the international gold standard? See, this is good to know this. It's when? 1971. Nin 1971 with Nixon, that's right. You said that's when we went, we shut the international gold. And that, now we've got dollar bills, see? These are dollar bills that I have. I, I think I still have one. Uh, <laughs> You better not mess with the $20 bill. Leave the 20 alone. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Now here's the dollar bill. Okay, what's this backed by? Nothing. Well, it's, it, it's backed by something. What is it? The full faith and credit of the United States of America, which isn't very full or faithful right now. But that's what it's backed by. So we, it's just kind of floating in the international market. And we've got to do something about it. What are you going to do about it? Get rid of the Federal Reserve. Yeah, and we'll talk about that in here. We talked about that in a class we taught. We told the whole story of it uh, and what actually happened there. And we talked about the Depression. And some of the people here in, in the class that are here right now have heard the story, I think. Uh, that didn't need to happen. The Depression didn't need to happen, but it did. And it's too long a story to tell. but. Be that as it may, um, we close the gold and the silver windows. We do not 
keep Article 1, Section 10 anymore. Uh, we seriously, must seriously look at the downward economic spiral that the Federal Reserve System has produced since 1913. Now you might say, well, we need, we, we need them because somebody has got to come in and be the lender of last resort. They've uh, accumulated much more power since then. That was the opening idea in 1913. If a bank uh, is losing money, if they've got runs on the bank, somebody's got to come in and, and replenish the bank, and that's what the Federal Reserve would do. But the problem is, uh, we're also under fractional reserve banking. What is that? It's what? You put a dollar in, and they can get ten out. You can. Well, you could. You now. You don't think your money when when they take ten dollars from you, they don't put that away somewhere. In, in they, they they put it in a in a in your checkbook, but they don't. They go lend it out. See, and they can lend out a hundred dollars with the 10 that you just gave them. There's something that we, we need to do something about that. That, that has never been uh, squarely uh, taken care of. That has to be taken care of. Um, all right, now, force. Oh, by the way, we were talking a little bit about the Federal Reserve Bank. These are the two books that you need to read. And if you... Don't, don't like to exercise too much in the morning. You can use these as weights. You can lift them up and you can get very healthy. But these are the two books that you need to read. I'll hold them up. I've been told that I don't hold them up high enough and nobody can see them. This is The Creature from Jekyll Island and this is The House of Morgan. This is Chernow and here's Griffin. This is an amazing, they're both amazing books. And they tell the story. Yes? Well, if you want to have a fun question, ask somebody which department of the government does the Federal Reserve go under? They're independent. They're independent. But you can read these two books. Here, that's, those are the two books. And um, this gives you the story. This gives you the story. Who owned Jekyll Island? J.P. Morgan. J.P. Well, you have a good teacher. You have, whoever's teaching that is good. Uh, J.P. Morgan owned it. They had a secret meeting in 1910. We know about that meeting now. Because as time passes along, people leak. See, people don't keep secrets, they leak them. And so now we know what happened there. And uh, we know that the Federal Reserve was set up under very bad pretenses. Now, it was Andrew Jackson that got rid of the United States Bank. And he got rid of it because why? You're supposed to know you've been taught this 30 times. I'm not saying a word. You can say whatever you want. Uh, why did the uh, Jackson get rid of the United States Bank? Well, you didn't need it, but the American people liked it. There was foreign money in there. There's foreign. Eighty percent of it was foreign or um, private. Twenty percent was the federal money. So he decided to get rid of it. He thought it was bad for America. And boy, he, what a, a battle royale he, he uh, fought. Oh my goodness, what a great man that was. I want to tell you something. We've done a terrible disservice to some of these presidents. That man should be on Mount Rushmore. We, we've done a terrible... He's the only president of the United States ever to do what? Balance the budget. Get us out of debt. Get he got us out of debt? No debt. $35 million surplus. Only president to do that. He's on the $20 bill. You better not take him off. Because uh, I have a, a spit gun at home I'll use. Um, you can't have force. Uh, Adam Smith said you've got to protect yourself against force. And force is the means by which the citizenry must do things which they are coerced into participating, which can be controlled by the gangsters and organizations like the mafia. We must have a stronger, we've got to have a stronger internal system like the FBI. It's got to be made stronger. CIA has to be made stronger, not weaker. You're We've got to have people on the ground that can get intelligence, uh, not just on computers. We've got to have them there to give us good intelligence. We, we're now getting great intelligence from Israel. Great intelligence. We've been getting great intelligence from them. We've got to have people on the ground. You know, um, in the days of Hoover, 
You had the Smith Act in 1940. What was that? Well, the Smith Act was a federal statute, June, 9, June 29, 1940, that set criminal pen penalties, criminal penalties for advocating the overthrow of the United States government the Sedition Act. and required all non-citizen adult residents to reg register with the government. <clears throat> now, you may or may not know this. We're going to get in, hopefully, I don't know if we're going to get into immigration or not. We've got it in the, what I don't get to is in here. Um, in 1954, we deported four million Mexican, Mexicans that came from Mexico. We deported four million. That was Eisenhower. Deported four million. So deportation is nothing new. It's not a new thing here. Um, approximately 215 people were indicted under the Smith Act in 1940, including alleged communist, anarchists, and fascists. You can't, you can't have that in the country, because you want to save the republic. Now you may say, yeah, but Joel, you're, uh, or you can call me Professor Marx if you want. Um, you, <laughs> you, I'm proud of my humility. Um, you, can say, <laughs> you can say, hey, that is wrong, Joel, because you're restricting First Amendment rights. Hey, listen, the First Amendment doesn't say you can do everything you want to do. You're going to go in a crowded theater and yell fire? You, are you going to slander somebody? You're going to go to court if you do that. No, you're not going to do that. And if you've got those that are trying to overthrow the government by speech, they can be, this was criminal in those days. Do uh, you remember Emma Goldman came here? She started to speak up and she was deported because they felt that she was saying things that were against America for the overthrow of the country. So th there has to be a limitation. You can't just have that uh, uh, willy-nilly. All right, now paroles. You've got to have stiffer paroles, and they, it should be more difficult to obtain short term. The death penalty should be instituted, in my opinion now, these are in these notes, you can disagree with it, but the death penalty should be on the table for sexual abuse of children or adults, child pornographers, terrorists in or, in or out of combat as threats to the nation. The death penalty must be on the table. You can't take that off the table. Now we have in the Constitution, in the Bill of Rights, uh, the Eighth Amendment. What's the Eighth Amendment say? Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed for cruel and unusual punishment. Cruel, or, cruel and unusual punishment. What is that? What is cruel and unusual punishment? Pulling out your fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. Waterboarding. Uh, we're talking about the death penalty, too. Cruel and unusual punishment is one thing, and then you have the death penalty. Administrative laws should not have the, the force of legislative law. And uh, who gave administrative law to be law? Who did that? I have the case here. When we get to the cases, I'm going to tell you the case we need to get rid of. Who did that? Wilson? No, I'm talking about what Congress branch of government. Supreme, Supreme Court. Court did it. Supreme Court. Supreme Court, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll give you the case when we get to it. Um, it's, it's absurd. That's an absurdity. But we, we need to know about this so that when you get up, when you, when you talk to your senator, or your congressman, we're going to take care of senators too. We're going, to, we're going to repeal the 17th Amendment. It's time to repeal it. What is the 17th Amendment? Senators. Elected, elected. It's what? Elected. Senators, yeah. Election of senators. Let's get rid of that. Let's go back and have the state legislatures appoint them. And why would that be better, do you think? Or maybe you don't think it would be better. But why could it be? Let's put it this way. I know I'm right, but I'm going <laughs> to act like I'm not. Uh, why could it be better? Well, you're going to take the money out of politics. And what else are you going to do? 
Well, we'll talk about term limits. That's a different issue. Well, you got accountability. Yeah. You do what? Accountability. They have to come back. You got accountability, and what else does it do? That's right. The accountability. You're going to give the states power. more power. States. States' rights. Yeah. State. This. This is not. This is a state document. I had to look to see what I had. <laughs> this, this is. <laughs> this is. This is a state document. The states have the power. That's where the power lies. And so, if you repeal the Seventh Amendment and let the le state legislators uh, appoint, you know, uh, I've told this story before, but when Lincoln and Douglas ran against each other in 1858, Lincoln out debated Douglas. Have you read those debates? Boy, I want to tell you something. That was a great man there. That was a great man. And, and, and Douglas was like four foot. 10. And Lincoln was six foot four. And it was, and he had funny motions. He'd get up there and he'd use his arms and all. But man, could he debate and think about what, it, what the comments that he was making. He out debated Douglas. How come he wasn't senator? They were running for Senate in 1858. Because the states appointed Douglas. Because the states appointed Douglas. Because why? Even though Lincoln out debated Douglas. And people were, for, they, they, they said, this guy's great. Why did Douglas get appointed? He was a Democrat. He belonged to the majority party, which was the Democrats. And of course, the Republican Party was new. It was a, it was a new party then. The federal government is very, very small. As a matter of fact, in the year 1902, excuse me, 1903, 1903, what was the federal budget in 1903? Just take a guess. $12. $12. Oh, that's, a, that's a great guess. We're going to send you back to kindergarten. Uh, who else has a guess? Six million. No. no. $734 million. Okay. Now, U.S. Steel merged. And it was worth $1.2 billion. U.S. Steel was bigger than the, the whole federal government. And Teddy Roosevelt took a look at that and he said, we can't have that. that that's, that's no good. Well, why can't we have it? Well, I don't know why we can't have it. It just, it, businesses can't get that big. Well, why can't they get that big? Well, because, it, it, is it a monopoly? No, it's not a monopoly. But, but government has to be bigger than big business. Human intelligence on the ground must be developed and enthroned once again, not discouraged, so that we're able to track down terrorists and subversives more quickly in days, not years. We must have a better system to root out traitors, committing treason by reinstating congressional and Senate internal investigation committees, which we've completely, we have completely, we, we have none of that. If we didn't have the House Un-American Affairs Committee in 1948, Alger Hiss would never have gone to jail. And he had to go to jail. He absolutely had to go to jail. And um, he um, was at Yalta, Alger Hiss. And, and uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was very, very sick at Yalta. As a matter of fact, he probably should never have made that trip. It was a very long trip to Yalta. And uh, Stalin uh, wanted him to make the trip. And he made the trip, and Churchill came all the way down from England. And they got to the table, and uh, Roosevelt was so sick that he was depending very much on his advisors. And the advisors that knew more than anybody was Alger Hiss. And what you need to do is read, um, who was the Secretary of State at Yalta? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't know this, your children don't know it either. It wasn't Stimson. He was, he was Secretary of Defense. Uh, who was Secretary of State at Yalta? Statinian. No, not Harriman. Statinius. Statinius was the Secretary of State, and he had only been there two months. His was the one. So Statinius wrote notes, and he left them at the University of Virginia. He wrote all these notes. He's written a book, too. And when you read the book... Uh, they would ask Titinius questions, the, the author of the book, and he said, Go, ask Alger, he knows the answer to that. He said, well, how about this question? Well, ask Alger. He ha you have to have a system of internal um, 
Congressional and Senate internal investigations. We can't have people that are in the government that are advocating the overthrow of the government. Um, you need to read this book in your spare time. After you read the Federalist Papers and you read The Wealth of Nations, you read this, blacklisted by history. Just read, just read it with no preconceived notion. It's very good work done here by Stan Evans. Uh, but there's a woman named Bridget Gabriel. You've seen her on TV, haven't you? She wrote a book called They Must Be Stopped. She's talking about Islamic fanatic terrorists and so forth. And she is saying in her book that we have a similar problem in our government with infiltration from those with radical Islamic thinking. As well as security concerns worldwide. Well, if we know that, then we need to do something about it, don't we? Something has to be done about it. Now, um, as a foreign policy initiative, we must never negotiate with terrorists for hostages or for treaty terms. We shouldn't be doing that. Like modern day Persia or the Iranian government, or give trade privileges or exchange embassies to avowed enemies such as Cuba. Now, you may do trade with some of these uh, countries, but you shouldn't do trade that would help them in their uh, military stockpiles. You may have free trade with them if, if there's an advantage for Remember, America's not a piggy bank. We've got to have a self-interest. We're doing things in our self-interest too. It's not just to give away whatever we have. We want to. We want to. We we're in debt. A hundred to two hundred trillion. How much in debt do you want to go? We don't just want to just give give away things. We want to go more. <laughs> well, um, we had a Monroe Doctrine at one time. Now we had uh, about a couple months ago. The Secretary of State said that um, the Monroe Doctrine is now dead. It's now dead, the Monroe Doctrine. What is the Monroe Doctrine? First of all, when was it written? Uh, early 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, when? 1812. Not 1812. Yeah. Good try. It, it was done with Pope. When was it written? That's a, a most, foreign, most important foreign policy doctrine we've got. I don't know. What year? Well, it must have been Monroe, right? Okay, when was he president? That's right, after Madison, that's right. So let's say 1817 to 1825. The Monroe Doctrine was written in 1823. Who wrote the Monroe Doctrine? You mean, who's buried in Grant's tomb? You're going to say Grant? Okay, who wrote the Monroe Doctrine? No. No. Who wrote the Monroe Doctrine? Anybody know? John Quincy Adams. Really? How do you like that? He was the Secretary of State at that time, 1823. And what did the Monroe Doctrine do? Keep Europeans out of the Western Hemisphere. Yes, keep, keep off. We don't want any enemies in the Hemisphere. And why don't we want enemies in the Hemisphere? That was what the, the Cuban crisis was about. That was what the Cuban... Now, uh, uh, Kennedy... Um, spoke about the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, why do you want to keep enemies out of your hemisphere? You do what? You want to keep the hemisphere safe. So you can have your quality of life, so you can have your country, so you don't want anybody... We uh, didn't want to fight on our own land. We don't want what? We didn't want to fight on our own land. We don't want to fight on our own land. Uh, we had that with Great Britain when they came here in 1814 and they stormed the, the Capitol, they burned it, they burned the Library of Congress, and then we had other books come in, and who supplied... Uh, Thomas Jefferson. That's right, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson... You're too darn smart. Uh, Thomas Jefferson supplied all the, I think it was 6,500 books he sold, and that was the Library of Congress. Well, um, let me read a little more of this. This is important. 
The Monroe Doctrine of 1823 was discussed by Monroe with Thomas Jefferson first. He got Jefferson in there. Jefferson was 80 years old in 1823. He got Jefferson in there and he talked about it. Uh, and written by John Quincy Adams, I told you. It should be reinstated uh, as its sole purpose to keep the Western Hemisphere free of enemies wishing to overthrow America. You don't want the country overthrown. You've got to have the country so you can go to Albertsons, you can go to uh, Kaleidoscope. Uh, where else do you want to go? 7-Eleven, you've got to get a big goal. You know, you want to... <laughs> you, got, you have to keep the country free so you can have all... You don't know how good we have this. This is amazing. This is uh, amazing. Uh, some people in some of my uh, classes say, well, but women didn't have their rights when we started the country. <clears throat> Did you think that they would have the right to vote when we started? No. There's countries all over the world now where women not only don't have the right to vote, but they're under the thumb of the, the man or Sharia law or some other uh, crazy thing. Um, we must eradicate terrorism worldwide, we know that. Linking with any government with these same objectives and never allow nuclear weapons to be obtained by hostile nations. Now there's 12 nations that have nuclear weapons right now. And if you count Israel, it's 13. Um, we can't have a hostile nation get a bomb because they'll use it. That, that can't, well we're hoping that that doesn't come to fruition. When we go to war, how should we do that? I know we go to win, but but what's the procedure? A declaration of war by Congress. Beverly is exactly right. That's true. We didn't do that in the Korean War. No, we don't do. And what's the what's the danger of not doing it that way? What what's the danger when you don't declare? Madison put that declaration in there. By the way, he said, "Let's put it in the Congress." Congress is uh, they represent the people. Yeah. And if you get the people on board, then you can do like we did in World War II. We all of a sudden ramp everything up. We got Rosie the Riveter. Everything's ramped up. And we can, in one cause, we can uh, ramp everything together and do it. So you, you have to declare it. Well, Korea was not declared that way. Yeah, and it became a very big anything. problem because you had a situation where mm -hmm. Mao Zedong and the Chinese came in and you had to determine, what are you going to do now? Are you going to bomb China? Or are you going to have a no-win war? Mm -hmm. And we decided that we were going to just uh, have the um, 38th parallel. That, uh, that's because of Truman. You, uh, you have to think that through. Well, um, now let me uh, say another thing here. We need to honor Israel's 1967 boundaries and must be defended by the United States, those boundaries. Um, the two-state solution should be negotiated if Israel wants it, they negotiate it. Let them negotiate it. We shouldn't be involved in whether that should happen or shouldn't happen. We've been involved way too much in that. Palestine got land in 1947. They rejected it. They had boundaries. Um, uh, should be negotiated by Israel and their sovereignty and internal affairs respected. No more land for peace scenarios like Gaza. Read Joel, I, I'm going to give you an assignment for tonight. It's not the Federalist Papers, but don't worry. It's Joel, it was so nice to name that book after me. I'm so grateful they did that. Joel 3.2. That's what you need to read tonight. It's only a verse and you'll read about what the boundaries need to be. And if you go into Ezekiel 47, you'll read what the boundaries will be. Ezekiel 47, starting the 15th verse. You'll read what the boundaries should be. But read Joel 3.2. If we go against Joel 3.2, all bets are off for Israel. Not we, if Israel does. Well, that's a long, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a long story. Now, it's now time. I'm getting a lot of stuff here. If you want to take a break, you can take it. 
I'm not taking a break. We're just going to uh, press, press on. It's now time to withdraw from the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and under other international organizations propped up by the American taxpayer, which are antithetical to American national interests. Amen. You get out. Well, wait, I'll get to that. <laughs> don't, don't jump the gun. One, one thing at a time. Uh, we need to look at the history of that. We tried it after World War II. We tried a lot of these international uh, arrangements. It's now time to relook at these things. If you're trading internationally, you're not an isolationist. And we trade internationally. I don't think we should politically entangle ourselves internationally. I think that's wrong. And I think it's been proven to be wrong. As a matter of fact, the Export-Import Bank should be abolished. And we just had a chance to do it, and they haven't. And I'll tell you what, that's right, they, did, they didn't do it. That's corporate cronyism at its worst, and you're paying for it. Because industrial favoritism for large companies like Boeing, they get loans from the Export-Import Bank. Yeah. They're able to compete with those loans. And 20% ratio of small businesses now must go it alone. It's time to go it alone. We're too much in debt. We can't keep doling all this, the loans and the money. No. The country's in a different... China, Russia, India, and Brazil do not play by the same international rules that the U.S. and 55 other nations do on those topics. The national interests of the U.S. will now be voted on and determine, now, okay, the president comes out and says, we're going to do this because it's in our national interest. We're going to stop that. That's got to be stopped. Now what we need to do is instead of doing that, the national interest of the U.S. will now be voted on and determined by the Congress in concert with the president. The Congress needs to vote on what on, because I don't agree with these national interests. Let the Congress get involved in this. They represent us. Let them vote on it. And then, the, the, then he, the president and the Congress can, can tough it out. They can have that little friction of the yeah, balance of power, the of uh, the part. separation of powers. Um, not just the president alone. This will ensure a say by the people's representative as well. We now must publicly know the exact discussions of the Bank for International Settlements. International, international Settlements as reported by the United States press, meeting with 53 central banks around the world. We don't know anything about this. We don't have their mi and minutes. We don't have anything. But our central banker uh, goes. They have these meetings about once a year. And they um, meet out policy controls for those banks, including the United States Federal Reserve Bank. Now, Bernanke, when he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve, well, by the way, there's no legislative authority from the United States Congress for this. Uh, he um, was being grilled. Where did the $2 trillion go? That, that the bank, I noticed it on your, on your uh, report. report. He said, well, that went to the central, you can Google this if you want. You don't need to believe me. I don't want you to believe me. As a matter of fact, I want you to go study. Um, he said, well, that went to the um, European Central Banks. So then Grayson says, well, where did they lend it? Who did they lend it to? He said, well, I don't know who they lent it to. And Grayson said, you don't know who they lent that to? Oh, don't worry about it. We're going to get it back in and we'll have interest. <laughs> American people heard that and they said, oh, ho hum. what's next? Yeah. We've got to stop this. This, is no, this isn't good. Uh, we need to know about this uh, Bank for International Settlements and the international role of the United States taxpayer in all of this. All international military organizations like NATO. Why was NATO created? Against communists. The Against the communists. Right. As a buffer for the communists. Do we want to be linked in like this? I think we need to look at this again. Can't we call in NATO to fight the communists here in America? <laughs> I don't think we do that. 
Uh, we need to th rethink that. Now, let's go to some really good topics that you're, you're going to want to really kill me for. First of all, we're going to go to prayer in the school now. Yes. Prayer in the school. I, uh, I'm going to bring this up. I'm hoping to live past 9 o'clock tonight. Um, is prayer in the school constitutional? Yes. Anybody say no? I did. Okay, good. How come? There's nothing in the Constitution that says you have to have prayer in school. There's nothing that says you have to have it, but there's nothing that prohibits it. The Constitution is silent on this issue, so what does that mean? It's up to the states. It's up to the states. States, right? Goes to the states. All right, now, Mary talked about the First Amendment. Here's what the First Amendment says. Congress. No, I want to read it this time. Okay. <laughs> Because I'm going to make a point. That's why. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. What's that mean? Mary, what's an establishment? If there's no state religion. Uh, you don't have to pay a tax uh, to support the churches. Yeah, there's no state church. Establishment of religion is a state church. Right. Like when we came from England, the right. Church of England right. was an establishment. Right. Right. It has nothing to do with prayer. No. That's just a, a term the Founding Fathers used. Uh, and it would be wise to know how what they, the terms they used, what they meant. All right, so that, that has nothing to do with prayer. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's the part we don't talk about. Let me embellish what I'm saying, because this is an important point. Prayer in school is not unconstitutional. It's a state responsibility. Now, um, the, um, it should be delegated to the school district. If the state says you cannot prayer in school, it's it delegated to the school district. The state should say that. Now you're going to say, and Bev brought up a great point. Well, who's going to say this prayer? Well, just a minute. We'll, we'll go into it. Uh, you've got a prohibition clause. You don't want to prohibit religion either. We always read the other clause, but we don't read that. The founders didn't want religion. Pro and by the way, why was the Bill of Rights written? What, what, what's, the, what's the purpose of the Bill of Rights? It's what? It's your right, your natural right, so they can't, government can't take it away from you. Well, but, but okay, but um, the government takes rights away all the time. Why was the Bill of Rights written? For clarity. Well, it, it put it more on paper. Madison at first didn't want the Bill of Rights because he said, well, look, all the rights are right here in the Constitution. We don't need the Bill of Rights. And he later got committed. The Bill of Rights are a check against the federal government. That's what it is. You're checking the power of the federal government. That's why they wrote it. Well, the Supreme Court has once again misinterpreted the original meaning of the Constitution. As there is no such expression as separation of church and state in the Constitution. But Jefferson wanted it. But he didn't mean it the way the Supreme Court in 1947, it was Justice Hugo Black. He was a bad guy. Who said... <laughs> I have this kind of cheering section over here. <laughs> and I, uh, he said that um, we have a separation of church and state. That's where the expression, it was Jefferson in 1803, in a letter to the Danbury Baptist Church. But Hugo Black uh, wrote this opinion in 1947 and said, We've got a very, we, got a, we have to have an impregnable wall, a very high wall. And from that point on, the wall is so high and so impregnable that we forgot that religion is a must. I was laughed out of a class the other day when I said religion and morality is a support to a nation. Without that, and they all laughed at it. And I think it was Ken over here. Ken is the only one that defended me in that class. He said, you better not laugh at that because he, I think he's got a point there. In 1962 you had a case called Engel versus Vital. It was a case about prayer in the school. And there was a prayer written by the state uh, that was an innocuous prayer. It was, I'll read it to you as we get to it. What I would do is this. I would have the school, school board needs to vote on it. Let's say they vote for prayer in the school. They have a big crowd that night, they're pressured. They, 
It's a four-three vote. Most people don't want it, but uh, they got all these people in the chamber, and the, they're going to have a rebellion. So they vote for the prayer in the school. Well, I would say you have students say the prayer, whether it's a Muslim. One day you have a Muslim prayer. Next day you have a Catholic prayer. A little child, little Jewish girl comes home and says, Mommy, I heard this Catholic prayer. They, were, they have rosary beads and everything. It was, I've never heard this before. Maybe you'll have a little tolerance. Maybe we'll get a little tolerance for other people's religion. Then the next day you have a, a Jewish prayer. You can what say it in Hebrew. child of an atheist family? If they're an atheist and they don't want to participate, they don't have to. But let's not cut off everybody else. If you don't want to participate, don't participate. Then you can have one day you can have this innocuous prayer if you want. That that doesn't it's, it doesn't have any particular religion. It's just a, a prayer. No, why can't they just pray at home? I mean, they can start their day off at, at, at breakfast and pray at home. They don't have to bring their prayer into school. What would you answer that? That's a good point. Uh, Sonny? No, what you can do is I, have a the, moment. The atheists I know would be very happy to get up and say, okay, these are the good wishes that I would, these are the good thoughts we want for the group. These are the good things we want to concentrate But how about what she said, Sonny? She said, why don't you just have a prayer in your home? That's, that's good. We have both. Because I've been in school districts where they did have prayer over everything. So, and nobody yeah, you could have both. About it. And there are people who were atheists and they said, hey, that's okay. Because I'm allowed to be an atheist too, and that you know, there wasn't the pressure. And so, you know, now, if you're an atheist, yes. What about like giving a moment of silence or something? That's what I want. You can have that one. You can have that. <laughs> one of the day. <laughs> Pray however they want to. Uh, it it won't. Hey, listen. It's not going to hurt the education of this country. How's it going to hurt it? Do you? Do you think that the education of the country, do you like what's going on now? This isn't going to hurt it. It may wind up helping it. What's that? Institutions are supposed to be an open forum of discussion. There shouldn't be any problem with discussing prayer in school. I don't think anybody has a problem with it. There should not be a problem. I don't think anybody's having a problem with it. It's an open discussion. I think we're having a good discussion. But I want to tell you, I think it needs to be back. I think it's a very important piece of, of um, religiosity that we've kind of disregarded. Well, by I remember when I went to school, we had prayer in the school. By getting rid of it, um, what, what you're doing, is, or by not having it, you're, the children are missing the opportunity to learn respect for other people. That's right. And to honor other people's belief systems and everything else. Absolutely. and that is uh, they don't learn civility and they don't learn morality because it's always being put down constantly by, by people who just want to divide, divide everybody. Without morality, we have no freedom. Right. Well, I would suggest, that's a good point, and I would suggest that everybody, I'm going to give you a homework assignment. You're going to read Joel 3-2 tonight, and you're also going to go home and read Washington's Farewell Address. He wrote it on my birthday. It was very nice of him. September 17th, 1796. I was there when he wrote it. What's the Northwest Ordinance? It, That's, it's what? It was written to uh, um, bring in the, the territories. You had the Northwest Territories, and they were deciding what was going to be taught and how they were going to divide it up and how they were going to organize it. And there were three things. It was July 1787 when it was decided, just before the Constitution was... Uh, written. There were three things in the Northwest Ordinance that were being taught, that they wanted taught in the schools. What were they? Religion is one. Morality is two. Knowledge. Religion, morality, knowledge. Those are the three things. Um, and I would suggest for all students in high school to read this. This is required reading. What is it? This is the Quran. Have you read it? Who said yes? Yeah, Gail, you read it. You read it. All right, I'm going to read something from it. Do you mind if I do? Every high school student should read this. Know your enemies. Very well. Come close. You need to read it and decide for yourself what's in it. 
I took it and I uh, marked it all up. That's the way I do. I mark my books up. And, yeah, we get um, that. Okay. Um, and I think it's important. This says, and this chapter is called um, Battle Array. And of Jesus who said to the Israelites, I am sent forth to you by Allah to confirm the Torah already revealed and to give news of an apostle that will come after me, whose name is Ahmed. Yet when he did miracles before them, they said, this is plain magic. And who is more wicked than the man who invents a falsehood about Allah? There is no Ahmed. Ahmed is Muhammad. And he's saying that Jesus said that an apostle named Ahmed would come. I've read the New Testament. There's no such thing in there. Now, either you're going to read this and decide for yourself, I don't believe the earth was invented with a blood clot. I don't agree with that. You need to read this. That's what it says. And all the, all the young people need to read it. That's what I think. Now, if you don't have a moral society, your society will crumble. It's as, it's as, it's as night and day. Uh, Washington himself said, you must have moral supports, and, you, and, if, and, and the person who thinks that, oh, I know what I was going to say, too, about atheism. If you have an atheist who doesn't want to say a prayer, that's fine. But atheism, according to the Founding Fathers, was irrational. They felt that atheism was irrational, and they had read the writings of John Locke, and John Locke had... Did you talk to your brain this morning? You did talk to your brain? No, that's what he said. Did it feel good? Uh, John Locke said you get up and you talk to your brain, and he talked to his brain, and he said, I'm going to see if I can find out if there is a God. And he worked the whole thing. I, I had another lesson on this that I taught a few lessons back. He figured it all out, and he said that atheism is totally irrational. It does not count as sound religion. Yeah. I want to answer your question. Yeah. Uh, an immoral stance by government is a repudiation of the Declaration of Independence. That's right. right. That's exactly right. Uh, Gail is right about that. And, and the Declaration of Independence that Gail's quoting is what we believe in. That's our belief system. And one man wrote it. He's my favorite president. We know. He's one of my, I'd say my, probably my favorite patriot. But one man wrote it. He happened to be there and he wrote it. Nobody else wrote it. It's quoted, I heard it quoted again, I think it was this morning. <laughs> All right, now, let's talk about the Supreme Court. There's major landmark decisions of the Supreme Court that need to be reviewed by judicial committee appointed by the Senate and the House, judiciary committees, as outdated and not applicable to our present society, with the power to change by the Congress under the exceptions clause of Article 1, Section 2, Clause 2. How do you like that? There's an exceptions clause in the Constitution. The Congress can override things. Now, Mitchum versus Foster on federal jurisdiction. How many of you have read the book, The Brethren, by uh, Woodward? Mary did. Mary reads everything I asked her to read. She's, she just, uh, she's becoming a library. I can't get through the Federalist Papers. I'm trying, but I can't do it. I mean, I can't do it. Oh, but you're trying. You're doing pretty good, aren't you? You're about halfway through. Mitchell versus who? This is Mitchell versus uh, Foster on federal jurisdiction. And on page 169 of the Brethren, they decided then state control and federal control in that decision. We need to throw that decision out. It was a 4-3 vote. Two of the Supreme Court <coughs> justices were not even there. We need to throw that out. It was a bad decision. Um, 1947, Everson versus Board of Education. That's, I talked about that decision. That's separation of church and state. Uh, that was Hugo Black uh, talking about separate. There is nothing in the Constitution 
of those type of words. There's freedom of religion. You have freedom to petition in the First Amendment. You have freedom to assemble, First Amendment. And you have free speech. You don't have unlimited speech. I've heard some people speak, I want to leave. You know, you have free speech, but that doesn't mean you don't have to listen. You're free. But uh, some speech is not speech. Pornography is not speech. The Supreme Court has said that it is speech. We have to change that. Uh, yeah, and I'll give you the decision. Yes. <laughs> Another decision we have to overturn is a 1973 decision. Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade. Now, Both. however you... <laughs> I'm glad Mary's here. We need that. Here's why we need to overturn it. Here's why. Forget the issue happens to be abortion, but let's put that issue on the side for a minute. Very Did you very read bad. Justice Blackman's opinion? It was very bad. Have you read the opinion? No. Forget how, how you feel about that. Kind of verbose. Not only verbose, it was, it was Disneyland. <laughs> He's going through the history of the Greeks and the history of the Romans and, and the history of the Mayo Clinic. And That's right. Who cares about all that? I want to know judicially, by law. Was, First of all, the, should the Supreme Court really have that decision? No. No. Why not? Why shouldn't they? Because they're supposed to have opinions. Well, they're supposed to have opinion, but, but um, what I'm saying, should the Supreme Court have had the decision on Roe versus Wade? Because I told you about Mitchum versus Foster. Well, why should the states have it? Because in the Constitution it says if you don't, uh, if it's not explicitly given to the federal, it's, it's the states. Amendment 10. But it, the states were having various opinions in different states. They and did. That was the reason it went to the Supreme Court, just like uh, other opinions have gone to the And it was also court. set up to other issues. Should they take that case? Yeah, should or should the state courts decide on state issues? Well, the they state had the courts chance. did decide, in, but it was, it was, uh, it was different, all, different in opinions state. in each it's state. Religious. So that's why they go up to the Supreme Court because it can't happen in one state. Well, well let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. This is a very good point. Should we be allowed to have different opinions in each state? Yes. 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 That's well, sovereignty of the state. That's why our divorce courts are so buried because of states. Well, uh, but that same state has a. You can choose whatever state you want. Let me mention something about social issues. Social issues, there's nothing in the Constitution about social issues. That's because there were no women founders. She's smart. She's right. But you never met Abigail Adams. Um, there's nothing about social issues in the Constitution. We have to work with what we've got. And so if there's nothing about social issues, what do you do about them? Do you say, well, I think there should be, so I'm going to put it in there. Because there's, there's certain rights. We're going to talk about the right to privacy in a minute. Yeah. But Please do. if there's nothing about social issues, then either you're going to invent it or you're going to stay this is a state responsibility because it says in the 10th Amendment that if it's not enumerated... It says the states or the people. They were... Yes. yes. But the, the, pe the people are represented in the states. Well, not as, the states can vote different than their people. They've done it before. But the federal That's true. Because but the it's supposed to be a representation of the people. States or the people. But if it doesn't say it explicitly, it's got to be a state responsibility. Oh, wait a minute. Let's let's read this. Instead of just talking about it, let's read it. Because let's understand. We have a Tenth Amendment here. And it has some very explicit things it says. It's very short. It says, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. Not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. Nor prohibited to it by the states. 
So it's not enumerated in the Constitution, but it's not prohibited by the states, are reserved to the states. Or to, or the, the, or to the people, which, <laughs> which they meant, that, that's the states, the, the people. Now what is Marbury versus Madison? I want every school child to learn that case. If they don't know anything else, they've got to know that. What is it? What's Marbury versus Madison? It's 1803. I was there when they were uh, writing it up. It's the Supreme Court case that gave the Supreme Court power to make some of the significant... Judicial review. That's right. It was the Supreme Court case that Justice Marshall um, said that the Supreme Court had judicial review. And he got away with it. What did Jefferson say about that? <laughs> Let him enforce it. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's a Jacksonian... Uh, Jefferson said, we're not going to do anything about this. It's, 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 a, it's a fantasy. Madison and Jefferson said no. And by the way, the reason that case came up, it shouldn't have even gone to the Supreme Court. That case came up because the Secretary of the State, under John Adams, did not deliver the certification for the Justice of the Peace of Washington, D.C. And who was the Secretary of State under John Adams? Who was Secretary of State that didn't deliver the certification so that Marbury, William Marbury, could be a Justice of the Peace in Washington, D.C.? Do you, you know who it was? Marshall! John Marshall was the Secretary of State. He didn't deliver it and should have recused himself in Marbury versus Madison. How do you like that? And by the way, Marbury versus Madison was a 3 nothing vote because there was only five uh, justices at that time. See, the, the Congress is in charge of the Supreme Court. They, can, they could have John Roberts in a candle if they wanted. They're the ones who created the Supreme Court. Well, we need to do something about Marbury versus Madison because the, there is no such thing as judicial review. That's a, now, Justice Scalia said, we know that Marbury versus Madison was made up out of whole cloth. But we like it. <laughs> well, of course you like it, because you, wouldn't you like to have the last word for uh, 300 million people? The American people have uh, delegated the responsibility to the Supreme Court, and since 1883, that responsibility has grown. Because we had a decision in 1883 that was called the Civil Rights Cases. And uh, that should have been overturned. It was not. Excuse me, it shouldn't have been overturned. It was. And it overturned the Civil Rights um, Act of 1875 that Ulysses S. Grant signed. Is judicial review the same as um, uh, case law? No. Judicial review is when the uh, Supreme Court says that they are the final word on the Constitution. They are not the final word because the President of the United States also takes an oath to protect and defend the Constitution. Your Congressman takes an oath to protect and defend it. <coughs> uh, the difference is that the President is the one who executes. He executes the law. If he sees something that's not constitutional because the Supreme Court's giving an opinion, they don't have any enforcement power. We've given them that. American people want everything right now. We want a decision right now. They take the oath, but you they don't understand it. <clears throat> well, uh, politicians today understand their districts, and they understand politics very well. History is another, another, another uh, issue. This is Abington versus Shemp. Uh, that's Bible reading in the school. Now you may say, well, we don't want to do that. I remember I was on a school board and I went to the superintendent and I said, uh, I had a private meeting with him. And um, I said to him that, um, you know, I really think that, um, that we should have Bible reading in the school. Well, then after I picked him up off the floor, um, 
He said, well, we can't do that. That's not constitutional. I said, oh, yes, you can. You can do that. You can have comparative religions. The Bible is, is a book that isn't a religion. It's a religious book. Um, number seven, Butler versus the United States. This is a decision in 1936 that says, uh, it, it, it talked about the agriculture of the AAA. That was the decision that was around, whether it was constitutional or not. But within that decision, Justice Owens, in a 6-3 vote, he was the opinion, said that we are now going to take the general welfare clause that's in the Constitution, and we're now going to interpret it the way Hamilton did. We're going to throw Jefferson and Madison out, and we're going to interpret it the way Hamilton interpreted the general welfare. Now, the budget of the United States of America in 1936 was six billion dollars. Two generations later it was six hundred billion. What is the general welfare clause in the Constitution? Because up until 1936 we were using Hamilton, excuse me, we were using Madison and Jefferson. Well the general welfare clause, according to Madison and Jefferson, anything that's enumerated in the Constitution, enumerated meaning it's stated, you can only do those things, and that would be for the general welfare. Hamilton said the general welfare can be anything that you would consider the general welfare for an area, for a state. And now what we've done, because of that decision in 1936, is that we have our congressmen coming back to your district and saying, well, look, I, I got your sewerage plan here. I got you a road. I got you an overpass. Uh, there's a, um, a structure I had built in your district. Well, I, wh where did you get that authority? Well, I got that authority from the General Welfare Clause. Now the senators say the same thing. They are now involved in this, this game of pork. They bring this back to the district. I don't want them to bring it back. I, I want to stop them bringing it back. Because that's not the general welfare. You're talking about earmarks. Earmarks? Eliminated. Yeah. We don't want any of that, and we don't want any spending of that sort. We want the states to do what the states think is necessary. We want that, that case that uh, Butler versus the United States to be thrown out. Hamilton did not have, as a matter of fact, Hamilton left the Constitutional Convention in late June, early July. He didn't come back for until about September. And when he was Secretary of Treasury, he was trying to do a few things, and some of the, the delegates to the convention said, you know, um, you can't do that. that. You missed that discussion. <laughs> you missed that part of the discussion. And um, one time Hamilton got up, it was June 19th, 1787, and he got up, and there was a rule in the Constitutional Convention that um, everybody could speak twice on one subject. That's good, because it gave you the chance to, it, you might change your mind. It's okay to change your mind. Somebody else might get up. Uh, 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 Luther Martin would get up from Maryland and he would give a, an impassioned speech. He was drunk most of the time, though. But he would give an impassioned speech and you'd say, you know what, I didn't think of that. I didn't, I didn't consider that. You know what, I'm going to change my mind on that. Well, uh, one time Hamilton got up uh, June 19th, 1787, and spoke for six straight hours without notes. Unbelievable. And what did he say? Well, he said, I think we should go back to the English way of doing things. I w they have the House of the Lords for life. The, we want the executive for life. <clears throat> and, the, and they listen for six. How, can you imagine listening six hours in that little room the, the windows are closed. I grew up in Philadelphia. It's humid. You've got a lot of men that are obese in there. I mean, it's, it's a miserable, miserable experience. And uh, Madison records in his notes, all applauded, nobody agreed. 
Not one person agreed with him. And the next day, Madison got up and said, look, we have, the, the Virginia plan is going to get us where we're going to go. The Delaware plan is not going to get us there. The other plans we've heard aren't going to get us there. It's the Virginia plan. And then they voted on it, and they voted for that. And, and Hamilton left after that. We need to get rid of the decision, Texas versus Johnson in 1989. You know what that was? Texas versus Johnson in 1989. What was that? Burning a flag. You got the notes there. Mm -hmm. What was it? Flag burning. Flag burning. That was a 5-4 vote. Now you say, look, Joel, you're wrong on this because we have free speech. Yes, we have free speech. But speech. we don't want to burn the symbol of everything we believe in. That's a special symbol. We need not to... L listen, I was in the state of Washington, and it was illegal to burn your garbage. So it's illegal to burn garbage and legal to burn the flag? Right. We've got to reverse it. It's a bad decision. I don't even think that's a, I don't even think that's a Supreme Court decision to be made. I really don't. I think Texas can take care of their own decisions. That's where the flag burning took place. They can take care of that. Well, I don't like uh, nine people making decisions for the entire United States of America. Amen. That's, that's not the way to do it. The founders didn't want a 5-4 vote and one person becomes a swing vote and makes that. That's not our form of government. That's not what the genius of this government is about. They were never supposed to have that power in the first place. That's right. right. The president could have executed or not executed that. Yes, but we, we haven't had since Lincoln. That's a good point that Craig makes. We haven't had since Lincoln a president not executing. Uh, we have to be careful that the president doesn't make law. If a law is written by the Congress, you can't, the executive department can't be changing the law. You have to have Congress do that. You have to, you have to execute the law. Even if you don't like the law, you, you know, but Supreme Court decision is different. That's because now you're talking about constitutionality by the executive. Executive now, order should be thrown out too. That's yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. We've got that in here, okay. executive orders. Now, number nine, Lawrence versus Texas. In 2003. Uh, that cop had no right to go in that house. <laughs> well, this is a sodomy decision. There you go. This is the right, this, this forged the right, well, forget about the cop for a minute. This is forging a right to sodomy. Now, I have read the Constitution. Believe me, I've read it. Really? I have not read that in there. In the Fourth Amendment, it says people have the right to be left alone in their homes. That's why he had no right to go. What if you have a warrant? I don't the warrant has to be, warrant has to be it has to be specific, but it has to be signed under oath. But we'll, we need to talk, we're going to talk about the right to privacy here. Let me get to that. Otherwise, I'll forget everything else. You can't get a warrant unless they've got good reason. Number 10, Wickard versus Filburn. What is it? Number 10 is Wickard versus Filburn. 1942 decision on commerce. Man was growing wheat in his farm. You remember that? Yeah. Remember that decision? It's a terrible decision. He's growing wheat on his farm for his family. And it came to the Supreme Court because they, for one reason or another, and they said it was part of interstate commerce. Interstate commerce club. Because he's eating the wheat and he's growing it and it affects the world markets. We, we, that decision has to go. Well, it's just like you can't grow any of your own tomatoes or something. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's another decision. Now we have the famous Griswold versus Connecticut. Yeah. I hope, does anybody have a Valium? 
<laughs> Mary's going to need it after I'm done with this. Yeah, of course. Cool. Um, what was Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965? What did that do? Birth control. They were handing it out in Connecticut, and the state was uh, uh, said that's illegal. You can't do it. You can't hand out birth control. Right. Yeah. Who right. can't? So Griswold appealed. That's how it got to the Supreme Court. Right. Um, beside who Griswold was and who's involved in this decision, because it's a long discussion, um, is there a general right to privacy in the Constitution? No, no. but you'd better have it. No. <laughs> neither one. No, she didn't get me there. <laughs> yeah, I think I did. Uh, there is no general right to privacy in the Constitution. There's a specific right, Fourth Amendment, specific in your papers and your uh, secure belongings and so forth. But there's no general right, and with that general right to privacy. We went down the slippery slope to Roe versus Wade. Then we had Lawrence versus Texas, because you got a right to privacy. There is no general right to privacy. Do you have a right to be left alone? Depends on what you're doing. It, it depends. It's not a blanket statement. The right to privacy is an invented right by Justice Douglas. Justice Douglas was the voice on this. And I'm not a Justice Douglas. I. I I think he uh, he he wanted rights to um, otters and mountains and seas and all that other kind of stuff. I, I am not a Justice Douglas fan. He's uh... <coughs> all right. Um, Stanley versus Georgia in 1969 was a United States Supreme Court decision that helped to establish an implied right to privacy. See, we take the slippery slope to that. In U.S. law, in the form of mere possession of obscene materials. Obscenity is not speech. Now, you may say it is. Uh, certainly James Madison, who wrote the uh, First Amendment, with help from, uh, from the uh, congressman in Massachusetts, uh, this is um, far beyond uh, what uh, is understood. Um, now, I want to go to a different topic. Before anyone graduates high school, each state, and they do it in North Carolina, should require a proficiency in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, major parts of the Federalist Papers, and I would add the Wealth of Nations as well, Amen. to foster good citizenship in the nation. And I want to tell you something. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are important. If you lose your history, the reading, writing, and arithmetic won't mean anything. You have to have history and you have to have it correctly, being correctly taught. You have to have your textbooks expressing the fact that in a great nation, there's some mistakes that have been made. We're tr we have tried to correct those mistakes. Um, but we don't want the country hijacked. Isn't that what that new history book did here in the I don't agree with that new history book. I spent seven to eight hours reading it, and I don't agree with what was in there. They should have voted against that. Yeah. The students also should be taught English history classes. Instead of sex education, I want to take that out. You may want it in. That's fine. This is my class. I'm taking it out. I want English history taught. I want um, to abolish sex education in place of English history. And this is what I want taught. I want them to learn the Magna Carta and the history behind it, because that's what we're trying to go back to. We do what? They used to teach that to us. Well, they're not doing it now. I want the Magna Carta taught. I want the English Petition of Rights in 1628 taught. 
I want the English Bill of Rights in 1689 taught what the history of that was. I want Blackstone's commentaries, a, a familiarity with it. Know what that's about. You're not going to read all four volumes of it. Lincoln read all four volumes. He never went to college. And look what he did. Look what he did. He saved the nation. He read Blackstone's commentaries. It was in the bottom of a barrel. He traded for it. Uh, I want uh, Algernon Sidney's discourses concerning government. I want them to be aware of that. This is the English history class that I'm, I want them to be taught. I want John Locke's essay concerning human understanding. I want them to understand that. With some acquaintance with Anglo-Saxon history from 450 to 1000, that would be mandatory. The Federal Education Department we will abolish. We're going to abolish it because by abolishing it, first of all, there's no grant for it. There's no grant for it. That's not a federal responsibility. That's a state responsibility. Give that to the states. Give that to the local schools. Let them decide what's best for, their, uh, for the children that live there. I don't want Washington, D.C. Uh, coming up with programs. If you abolish the education department, you also will abolish Common Core. That won't be there. If you don't like Common Core, abolish the education department. You're going to abolish No Child Left Behind. That's gone. Outcome-based education. When I was on the school board in uh, Federal Way, to the chagrin of the other school board members, um, we had outcome-based education, which I did not agree with with the Department of Education abolished, you won't have that. That's gone. A teaching of environmental green policies, that's part of the Department of Education's responsibility. We won't have that anymore. We're going to let each local district decide what they want to do. Let the school boards, the teachers, the administrators, with the parents determining uh, the curriculum for that particular geographic location. Now, there's a woman named Charlotte Iserbite. I don't know if you've heard of her. She wrote a book called The Dumbing Down of America. She's very eloquent. She worked in the, actually in the Reagan administration, she got fired. <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, you might want to become acquainted with that. And Norman Dodd's information regarding the Congressional Reese Committee findings of 1953 about education should be studied. Very important. All Indian treaties, facilities, casinos, fishing rights, <laughs> Sovereignty should be reevaluated. You're going to have a firestorm, I guarantee it. But we need to make some decisions that are better than what we've been doing. We need to immerse everybody into the American culture. Each male from 18 to 22 years old is required to enlist in any branch of the military for a period of not less than two years. Israel does it. Let's do that. Israel. Let's do it. Two years. During those ages, that's a, you're deciding. You don't even know who you are. We don't know who we are. We know we're here. You can say you're a child of God, but who are, what, what, what are you doing? What, who are you? What's your destiny? Why would you not have a universal? Women serve as well. Yes, I would have it universal. I would have women serve too. Women, I would have them serve. Yes, I would have it universal. This uh, military service, mandatory military service, will give all involved in it an appreciation of service to the nation and training to protect the homeland and any interest abroad, okay? 
Education will be re enthroned as a state responsibility. And I said the Federal Education Department will be dismantled and fumigated. <laughs> and um, because the Education Department was a political uh, decision by President Carter and the National Education Association. We need to go back and look at that and say maybe this wasn't a good thing. Wasn't it to raise the standard uh, across America that yeah. we started this? Because I yes. remember uh, that Mississippi and Louisiana had really uh, bad schools at that time. Yes. And they were segregated. And if, if you left it like that, they would have continued in that tone. They weren't going to go through integration of any kind, that's ever, true. ever. Well, that, that's true, but we have to take a realistic look and say, has it really uh, helped the, na the national education picture? I want a school voucher, which uh, the National Education Association is not for that. But I believe that uh, the parents should have a voucher for $2,500 to $5,000. Okay, take that voucher, and you can take that to the school that you want to take it to. Now you say, yeah, but that's bad for the public schools. Well, it may or may not be. It all depends where you live, and it depends the teachers you have in the public school, and maybe the public schools, if people are leaving them to with a voucher, maybe they'll raise their standards. The standards might go up. Um, I would eliminate teacher strikes. What about tenure? They have the right to strike. Eliminate that too. Well, the problem for a public uh, employee to strike, you're affecting. Uh, when when you have teachers striking, you're affecting a lot of children. And you're lopsiding the uh, contract possibilities on both sides. Because well, somebody does not have to negotiate with you because you have no recourse, period. Well, there's, that's a good point. And there's going to have to be a mechanism put in where there is a recourse. You're talking about I just don't think strikes is the recourse. There, there's going to have to be another method, and, and that's going to have to be determined. Um, now, foreign policy and economics. You want to take money out of politics. I keep hearing... We've got to take money out of politics. It's destroying us. It's terrible. It's horrid. Okay? You want to take it out? Are you serious about that? Do you want to take it out of politics? Okay. You're not going to do it by restricting speech. I am against that. I'm against restricting speech. First of all, you repeal the 17th Amendment. That's the first thing. Immediately. It's time. I was on a television station the other day, and... Uh, uh, I was asked something about that. I can't remember what I was asked. But I said, the repealing of the 17th Amendment, it, it's, it's time now. It's time to do that. Uh, we need to have senators representing the states and being accountable to them. Um, so I would, re and that would take a lot of money out of that particular race. I would re enthrone the original idea of the Electoral College. Now, I'm not going to have anybody agree with me on this, but I don't care about that. I'm just going to tell you what I think should be done, and then somebody in here that's young, that may be President of the United States someday, they hear it and they say, you know what, that's a good idea. I don't want the President elected by us anymore. I want him elected, now you're going to say, well, they're already elected by the Electoral College. Yeah, but there's a popular vote that determines who gets it, and then Republicans and Democrats go into a convention, and all the votes of that state, let's say Oregon voted for, um, for, the, for Hillary Clinton, let's just say. Oregon voted for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Should I have not brought that up? <laughs> I'm so naughty. <laughs> let's say they vote for Hillary. Um, all seven votes all seven electors are decided in the Democratic State Convention. And they are usually um, obligated to, to cast their vote for Hillary. Here's how I would do this. I would say that um, each state votes for electors. See, Madison's the one who thought this up. 
I think each state should vote for the electors, and you have an election. Now you have seven in the state of Oregon, right? Yeah. California has, I don't know how many, but a lot. Do you know, Pat, how many California has? It's a, it's a, it's a Trevor tro trove of, of electors. Each state votes for the electors. They have to campaign. And you're going to be very critical on what they say in that campaign, what they're for. And it doesn't matter, Democrat, Republican, Independent, people are going to vote for these people. And those seven electors are going to decide with the other electors in the country who the President of the United States is going to be and who the Vice President is going to be. And that way we don't have a two and a half billion dollar campaign. We take the cut. You don't like the Koch brothers or the Koch, what are the Koch brothers? You don't like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Soros. Soros. George Soros. You don't like them involved in the, uh, in, 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 uh, you think there's greed there? They're, get them out of it then. Now, you say, well, how about the House of Representatives? Also his son along with it. Here's what I would do with that. By law, if you're running for Congress, let's say in the state of Oregon again, you can only raise money in the state of Oregon. That's it. Or in your district. Now, that depends on who wants to do what. Okay? Now, you know who's going to pay the senators and the congressmen? Not the federal government. That's where they get the money now. The states decide. The state will decide how much that person makes. And, and if, the if it's different, you might say, well, that's wrong. Because the congressman from Oregon is only making 3000 a month. <laughs> but yeah, but in California, the congressman is making 6000 a month. That's wrong. We got to make it easy. No. That's what Oregon decided. Yeah, but they can't live back in Washington, D.C. Well, then don't run for the office. If you don't think you can do it, don't, don't do it. But that's what the pay is. Each state will decide. You want to take the money out of pot? Are you serious about this? This is the way to take it out. Don't restrict. Uh, you keep talking about the big corporations, but the unions are in Citizen United, too. Unions are They're there. They're in that decision. You're in the decision. It has to be overturned. But this is the way to take it out of politics. All right, now, let's repeal the 16th Amendment. Let's repeal that too. That's income tax. We're going to repeal that, and we're going to put in its place. This is my world, by the way. We're going. <laughs> we're going to. I'm surprised you're still here. <laughs> We're going to put in its place a non-revenue neutral, not revenue neutral, a non-revenue neutral flat tax of 15%. Yep. What does that mean, non-revenue neutral? Non-revenue neutral. Uh, revenue neutral is the government takes in $3 trillion a year, let's say. Revenue neutral would mean that your flat tax, let's say you had it for, you would have to uh, figure out a flat tax that raises the three trillion, <coughs> which might be 30 percent, mm -hmm. whatever it is. I would have a non-revenue neutral. And um, then the government would thenceforth be reduced in real terms by congressional apportionments and budget committees. Complete free trade with no tariffs. How do you like that? No tariffs. We're not going to have a steel tariff anymore. We're not going to, we're going to let in the South Korean steel. We're going to let them into the country. Oh, yeah, but we can't do that because, because um, United States steel go under. Well, maybe they got to make better steel. The president and Congress are going to reenthrone the philosophy that individuals may make as much money as they would like without retribution on the tax code. Of course, we're not going to have a tax code when I get done because we're going to have a non-revenue neutral flat tax of 15%. All property is sacred whether you're rich or poor. It's all important. Property is an inalienable right and nobody can alienate those rights from you. Amen. Government does, but they shouldn't be able to. Lower the corporate tax to zero. Now we have um, Chris Christie is running for President of the United States. 
He wants to lower it from 35 to 25. That's a good start. But you, but the goal is to lower it to zero. Why? What's that? Well, flat tax will be on income. Our tax, corporate tax is 35%. Now, inheritance tax? Um, zero. Yeah, I agree with that. Because the next generation, not government, should grow in wealth. We want the next generation to have that money. Right. What's the 26th Amendment? It needs to be repealed. It's time to repeal it. What is it? 18 year old vote. We're going to repeal that. I don't want 18 year olds voting anymore. We had that because it was the Vietnam War era. Vietnam War era. And we figured that, look, we're sending 18 year olds to Vietnam. They can vote too. All right. Now we're going to repeal it. Now we're going to have older than 18, probably 21 or 22 or 23 vote. We want to return to constitutional principles as the framers originally expressed their sentiments as discussed at the Constitutional Convention. So that means that you have to be acquainted with the state ratifying conventions as well as Madison's notes and the Federalist Papers, particularly the state conventions in Virginia, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and New York. Um, you're going to be required in my history class that I'm teaching in high school to read Andrew Jackson's bank veto message. It's greater than any Federalist paper. Every American, not just high schoolers, every American should read Andrew Jackson's bank veto message of 1832, and it should be read along with George Washington's farewell address in the Congress. We will now have four national holidays celebrated and studied separately. We're going to have Martin Luther King's birthday. We, we study everything about Martin Luther King. I think he, gave a, he wrote a tremendous letter from the Birmingham jail, and I think people need to be acquainted with that. But I'm going to add some other things. I want three other national holidays. We're going to have George Washington's birthday. We're going to have Abraham Lincoln's birthday and Thomas Jefferson's birthday. And we're going to study all three of them because Martin Luther King took the words of Thomas Jefferson. So I think it's only fair that we understand the author of the words of Martin Luther King. And we're going to have a national holiday and each student is going to learn what Washington, Lincoln, and Jefferson were all about. Yeah. We're going to eliminate the filibuster rule in the Senate. That needs to be thrown out. We are now not going to decide things by 67 votes. We need 51 <clears throat> votes to make decisions in the Senate. However, you keep cloture at 60 votes. You don't let them debate. You get 60 votes. The debate stops, then you vote. You need 51 votes to make decisions. Majority party cannot kill bills and bury them without a vote. If the House of Representatives sends over a bill and they voted affirmatively on that bill, the Senate has to take action on the bill. The Supreme Court shall follow only their authority in the Constitution, and judicial review as a judicial doctrine shall be completely removed because we have said that Marbury versus Madison is not a decision. It is nothing. It will be null and void. And we're going to honor the 78th Federalist by Hamilton. We're going to eliminate the EPA. And we're going to put it under the... Um, Department of Interior as a sub-department. We are... Um, Department of Interior. We, we, we put that in there as a sub-department. We're going to abolish national parks. Oh, boy. I know. <laughs> I know. 
Nobody's going to give me any more cookies. <laughs> That's it. Now, here's what we're going to do with the national parks. We're going to take Yosemite, and the federal government say, we can't maintain it anymore. The state's going to take it. We can't maintain Yosemite. California, you have it, and it's your land. You do it. What, it's a state responsibility. You take care of Yosemite Park. You probably are going to have better maintenance of the park. You will have better maintenance of Yosemite Park because right now there is a. Well, that's up to the state of California. Some of you aren't going to like this, but this we're going to have to do this. It's not an if. You get into a crisis, you're gonna have, everybody's gonna have to sit down at the table. You're gonna have to sit down at the table and you're gonna have to work it out. Nobody's gonna leave the room. There's like J.P. Morgan. He took him on his, his uh, Corsair yacht and he put all the bankers in one room, he locked the door. And he went and played solitaire. He says, you're not coming out until you make a deal. Four o'clock in the morning, they got his signature. National debt handled by spending controls and cuts in discretionary and mandatory spending. You're going to have to look at Social Security. You're going to have to look at Medicare and the farm programs. The farm programs that Calvin Coolidge vetoed. You're going to have to start to um, sell off federal lands. Federal lands are going to have to be sold off. I'm sorry to say that, but that's going to have to happen. Social Security and Medicare. Let's give the responsibility of Social Security and Medicare to the states. Which means we get nothing. Well, here's the way that I think we should handle it. They'll determine, the states will determine whether to keep it or not keep it, okay? If the states do not undertake it, then it will be phased out. You have, you let everybody know we're going to phase it out in 20 years. You've got 20 years and we're going to phase both of those programs out. In the meantime, everyone has time to adjust. You all have time to adjust now. And this is what you can do. Citizens have a choice of one, to continue drawing checks from Uncle Sam, but you would draw from state, keep their money and invest it privately, or have the government invest your share into a private investment with a guarantee of a trust fund. Right now, there is no trust fund. You make that decision. I don't trust the government. Because Social Security was never social and never secure. Never has been. And there is no trust fund. You need to have a trust fund. Social Security will be separated from the general fund. It will not be part of the general fund. And um, you will now, we are now going to reinstitute the idea that we used to have in the 50s of county hospitals. We're going to have county hospitals where if you are sick, you go to the county hospital and one day a week doctors uh, gave their time for no money and they went to the hospital once a day, uh, once a week, uh, yeah, once a week, and they were able to uh, administer to, to patients in the county hospital. And one more thing, it's five after, you stayed long. I said maybe 9, 9, 15. I want to tell you how we're going to do welfare now. After the 20-year period, here's what we're going to do. No? No. You have to have a society that takes care of the those that can least afford to take care of themselves. So here's what we're going to do. There's going to be eight, eight ways to do this. Now remember, there's no welfare in the federal government anymore, in this world. The first one you go to for if you're needy, you don't, you're, you're really hurting. Where do you go first? Your family, all right, you go to the family. Okay, they, they can't help you. Your family can't help you for, for one reason or another. Where do you go then? Church. No, you don't go to the church. You go to your relatives. Let's say you got some uncles that are really nasty, you know, like your, your aunts and uncles. They're nasty. They're not going to help you. Your cousins, you went to your cousins. You know, the Roosevelts had cousins all over the place. Of course, they were wealthy, but uh, you don't have anybody relatives. 
So then where do you go third? For church. You need help. You go to your church. All right? You go, to the, you go to the Presbyterian church. You go to the Methodist church, Catholic church. You go to the LDS church. You go somewhere. Let's say the church doesn't have enough the for you. Where's the fourth place you go? The church. Salvation Army. Yeah. Salvation, you go You go to your local charities. Salvation Army. You go and go to Goodwill, right? Access. You could go to Access. You can go to, what's that, St. Uh, Saint Vincent de Paul. All right. So that's, but let's say there's a big surge of people going to these and they're, you know, kind of down. This is the fourth, now this is the fourth place you've gone to. Where do you go now? United Way. Well, let's say United Way's in here. United Way in, into this. Where do you go for the fifth choice? You go to a foreign government and ask for some of the stuff we've already given. Where, where do you go fifth? Join the army. The city council. City council. The city, the local government. They can take care of your welfare needs and they know who you are. They can take care of it. So you go to the local government. Let's say they don't, they can't help you. County. Where do you go then? You go to the county. That's right. Exactly right. And they can't help you and you go where? To the state. state. And that's it. And it stops right there. That's how you handle welfare. Wow. And you, go to and you yeah. stop the federal responsibility. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I just want to say one thing before you go. Let me... Uh, America now needs you very much. And Edward Everett Hale said this. I am only one but I am one. I can't do everything, but still I can do something. What I can do, that I ought to do, that I ought to do by the grace of Almighty God, I shall do. Now, one other thing. Longfellow wrote a very beautiful poem about this country. And I'm just going to read you a teeny bit of it. And then I'm going to send you off. Thou too oh, thank you. sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union, strong and great. Humanity with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. God bless you all. Thank you.